Yeah, I came to India way long back, 1993. I was one of the very first explorers in India, actually. When I came to uh, Udaipur, there wasn't even a cash machine. I'm like, I sort of think of myself like Paul Gauguin, who, who went off to Tahiti. Tahiti. He went to Tahiti and, and he lived with the natives, all these naked natives running around naked with, with their breasts hanging out. And, and he painted oil paintings of them and, and, and he lived like a native. It was so primitive. And, then, and then, then he went back to Paris and he sold these paintings. And I mean, I'm, I'm just the same way. It's just... Just I, I haven't been real lucky with galleries in Paris, but I'm certainly living very primitively. So, welcome back to another episode of What is Rotten in the Art World. And today what I'd like to talk about a little bit is the myth of the artist and how that relates or doesn't relate to the work of the artist. Now, it's very fashionable these days, and possibly correct, to talk about the death of the author, which I think it was Roland Barthes who came up with that initially, the concept of the death of the author. Namely, once a work of art is finished, it's departs from the author. The author no longer has any control over it. It's up to the interpretation of the society with which, within which the artwork lives and exists to give it meaning and give it interpretation. And the artist or the author has no more claim over it. It becomes a unique thing unto itself. That sounds rather idealistic. Um, in many ways it should maybe be true. Um, when we think of things these days like, oh, the, the controversy over people like Pablo Bartholomew, not Pablo Bartholomew, well, yeah, Pablo Bartholomew, or Pablo Picasso, or Sabod Gupta with the Me Too movement, you know. Okay, artists who have had some shade cast upon them because of allegations or possibly proven incidents of sexual harassment. How do we deal with that? You know, do we say now that everything that Pablo Picasso ever produced is worthless? We shouldn't give him credit for anything anymore for what he did, because now we know how horrible he treated women. Should we look with a, a scant eye at the work of Sabod Gupta or Pablo Bartholomew? It's hard for me to talk about Pablo because Pablo's been an old friend or somebody I really like to think of as an old friend. It's very difficult to know. I like to think that art exists on its own. And I like to think that we need to realize that just because an artist has been discredited in some way or shamed in some way or we have found some problem with his life style his life does not necessarily mean we totally forget about the artist's work or that we totally forget about the artist because i think we always need to keep things in perspective which is one thing our current age seems to be very bad at because we're in the middle of such a huge culture war in the middle of such a huge culture war, everybody's so busy firing ammunition from one side or the other, 
Everybody's willing to pick up on incidents, little details, big details sometimes, sometimes not details at all, but use them as ammunition to discredit somebody that they may not like or for what they perceive as a just cause, which may or may not be a just cause. Okay, so we say that. Yet this whole idea of the mythologizing of the artist, artists do get mythologized. I mean, going back to Michelangelo and his relations with the battles with the Pope of Rome, um, going back to Caravaggio and his battles in Florence and Rome, his many, um, now we know we are quite certain that Caravaggio had many young boys as lovers, probably underage, probably a pedophile. He killed somebody. Caravaggio killed somebody in a sword fight. He had to escape. I think he escaped to Malta. He tried to become a member of the Knights of Malta, thinking that would save him. Then he got into some trouble in Malta and had to escape again. Tried to make his way back to Rome, I believe, and what happened? Was he shipwrecked or did he just land on the wrong coast? I forget. But anyway, he never made it back to Rome. He died in transit. All of that becomes part of Caravaggio's mythology. And yes, yes, Gauguin, going off to Tahiti. Many stories there, many young girls, many young girls that probably contracted syphilis or gonorrhea due to Paul Gauguin. You look back at that and you think how horrible, but then at another way you have to think it was a part of the times. Mm -hmm. Gonorrhea, syphilis was rampant at the time. If you were at all sexually active, you had a good chance of possibly getting it. Um, now, obviously, the women in French Polynesia had no preparation for it, but by the time Gauguin got there, they knew that these diseases existed. I'm not defending him, I guess. He was rather a disreputable character. But I also know I've gone to see Gauguin's work in the Art Institute of Chicago. And every time I stand in front of one of his paintings, I'm in awe. I think they're incredible. I just drool over a Paul Gauguin. I think it's such a wonderful, wonderful work of art. His color use, his texture, the way he applied paint, it was marvelous. And to think he was doing it at that time, <sighs> you have to put things in perspective. And I think our age has really lost the ability to put things in perspective. We pick up on little things people say, little things people do. We bend them all out of proportion. And then we use them to classify them in somewhere, categorize them and discard them. And that's a difficulty. And even if we're given to the temptation to do that, should we discard the art? I also happened to be in Moscow shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, 1994, I think it was. There was incredible Soviet sculpture, absolutely incredible Soviet sculpture. Now, I have no sympathy for the Soviet Union. Well, in my youth, I did. I was an idealist. But by that time, I was losing that idealism already. Yet when I came across the sculpture of the Soviet Union made by the Communist Party, I was in awe of it. Some of it was gorgeous. Some of it was moving. You know, the metro stations under Moscow, the metro station under Red Square is awe-inspiringly beautiful. How attached should we be to the ideology that created that art. I don't know. Does the art have a life of its own? Does it speak different meanings these days? Perhaps that art speaks different meanings today in 19, in 2019 um, than it did in 1994 or than it did in 19. 54, 1946, 
the meaning of our changes with time. We shouldn't be so eager to discard it because what might appall us today, we might find magnificent and enriching in the future. So the myth of the artist, um, I happen to like artist myths. I think they're important. I love to read biographies of artists. Oh, I've slowed down with that in my older age, but I think that the biography of the artist, the myth of the artist is often the, the spice that gives meaning to the work. It gives, I shouldn't say it gives meaning, it gives additional flavor to the work. The work should have meaning on its own. But knowledge of the artist gives an additional flavor to what you're viewing. It gives a subtext and it makes the work more meaningful in many, many ways. And it makes you view it in a little bit of a different light, hopefully a deeper light and with a deeper understanding. Um, I worry these days with the amount of emphasis on, oh, Collaborative practices like my own, uh, collectivist art, a feeling through postmodern deconstruction that somehow everything that's been built up needs to be torn down, torn down to its raw elements. We have to pick everything apart, find the basic power structures, find out the power motives, you know, sort through the identity politics and say, no, no, this isn't good, doesn't fly. Yeah, that's our time that we're living in. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. I think an artist without some sort of mythology attached to him or her, be it Frida Kahlo or Georgia O'Keeffe, or Amrita Shur Gill, or Manjit Bawa, Ram Kumar, like this litho behind me. Without some mythology attached, art becomes very bland. And to discard it in the name of deconstruction and postmodernism becomes a very sad and in my mind not a noble thing not something worth pursuing not something that in the end will enrich us spiritually i'm not talking materialistically to some extent i am but spiritually won't won't enrich us so i just wanted to say that today and thank you again for watching. This is Wazo X Wazo, the evil orientalist, speaking to you from Udaipur, Rajasthan. Please like on YouTube and please subscribe. It really helps. Share if you can. That helps too. Thank you. Goodbye. I think I'm getting really, really good at these uh, FN Sousa drawings. I mean, it's just, the more I do, the better they get. I mean, look at these. Look at these. These FN Sousas, they're like, this needs more work, you know. But this, with the arrows, I mean, this is like, this is pure Sousa. And look how good I'm getting at the name. Look at these two. I mean, it's like... They could be pages from a notebook. I even tore the edges a little bit. And look at the name. I think this is really great. And it's like, you're recording me. Don't, don't oh. record me. You're not supposed to record this. No, off, off, turn it off.